welcome back. Our guest is Frank Lowy. Mr Lowy, I want to take you back to your childhood uh, for a moment. You grew up as a Jew as anti-Semitism was really sweeping Eastern Europe and you survived the war living under terrifying conditions uh, in Budapest, in Nazi-occupied uh, Budapest. Your father, of course, was taken to uh, Auschwitz. It took you 40 years, as I understand it, to talk about this with your family openly. You bottled it up for a long time. How do you feel about it now? Well, I mean, the, the talking about it is a good thing. Because if you, if you, don't, if you keep bottling it up, well, you know, that kind of bottles explode if they, if, if they get over, overfilled, you know. So um, it was a very good thing for me to talk to my family about it. I think I shocked them quite a bit but it brought us closer and it made my life a lot easier. And uh, I do talk about it now freely, uh, without hate and without bitterness. And I think this is also a good thing, even though those things were horrible to descri even to describe them, or even to, to I mean, remember them is not, not, not that pleasant, of course. But I think it's good to talk about it uh, in a proper way. Yeah. You say you can talk about it without hate and without yeah. bitterness, but yeah. does that mean you don't hate the people who did the things they did to your family? Well, probably most of the people are not there anymore, you know. And uh, hatred and bitterness makes you bitter, oneself bitter, so I try not to be that way. And what sort of, how did that sort of upbringing uh, affect the, your character, make you the, the man that you are? Well, it's hard for me to describe myself, I'd rather not actually. Uh, but obviously it affected me. It affected me in a way that uh, probably made me a lot harder than otherwise I would have been. And uh, I think it gives me a wider perspective. I think uh, I know what not to have. What does it mean not to have? Either freedom or food. And uh, these are lessons that uh, would be I would not enforce on any young person, but if a young person goes through that, I think it'll be better for, it'll be better for, for, uh, for general life, I think. And uh, it gives you a different uh, view, perspective of life altogether. You fled to what was then Palestine and, yeah. uh, and, and fought for the creation of the state of uh, Israel. Yeah. Uh, you took up arms against the Arabs in the Arab-Israeli yeah. war. Yeah. Uh, and you suffered some pretty serious injuries along yeah. the way uh, yourself yeah. uh, during that war. Yeah. This is all in the name of creating the state of yeah. Israel as we now yeah. know it. So I'm just wondering what you now make of the push for a two-state solution. Do you have sympathy for the Palestinian side of this conflict yeah. and their push for a homeland of their yeah. own? I definitely have sympathy for uh, the Palestinians, but um, I think it's essential to recognize Israel's right to exist in secure borders. And I think that the two-state solution is an ideal one if both people can cope with it. Uh, after so much hatred, it would not be easy. But I think, uh, I really think that's the only real solution that can solve the problem of Palestine and, uh, and, and Israel. What did you make of President Barack Obama's speech in Cairo where he made it clear there needs to be a two-state solution and also said, for the Israelis on their part, they need to stop building in the West Bank. Yeah. Well, I think you will find that uh, a big portion of Israeli population believes in the same things because, of course, it's a free democracy. And although we have, uh, I mean, Israel has a right-wing government right now, but you'll find that most Israelis would be happy with a two-state solution and they really don't want expansion of uh, of the settlements. So I shared that view. There is differing views on what a two-state solution might mean. Uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, of course, has said that uh, the Palestinians can have their own state, but no defence force, no military. Uh, and some would argue that that isn't uh, a realistic option. Yeah, well, it may not be a realistic option, but I think you need to take into consideration the past and there needs to be a transition of uh, between these two people so they can trust each other. And I think uh, once that is established, I think anything is possible beyond that. Do you think there is the grounds for that trust at the moment? Well, I wouldn't think so today, but eventually two people will realize and recognize the only way out 
is to come an accommodation between these two people. I mean, there's one, one country, so to speak, and two people want it. So the only way to, to, to exist is to coexist. And I think that's the basis of any kind of agreement that will have to be coexistence peacefully. For some time, Israelis have seen as their biggest threat Iran, not so much Hamas and Hezbollah, but, but Iran is, is, is pulling the strings. What did you make uh, and what do you make of the protests that we've seen? These extraordinary scenes of tens of yeah. thousands of Iranians yeah. marching in the streets in protest at uh, what they believe was a sham election result. Uh, what has that meant for you? Well, I think it reflects that people want to be free, want to have a democratic government and free to do what they lawfully can do. And, uh, and that's what the Iranian people want to express now. And I think that's, what, that's the picture we see. And um, it's not unreasonable for them to want to do that. The, 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 the most precious commodity in life is freedom. When you came to Australia uh, in the early 1950s, your first business was a, uh, a small, a humble uh, delicatessen in Blacktown in Sydney's yeah. west. And that, I yeah. guess, was the seed of what is now the, uh, the global Westfield empire. Yeah. You now have shopping centres stretching yeah. across Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Great Britain. What would be your advice to someone starting out in business today? Are there still the same principles that applies in the 50s or is, has business changed somewhat, particularly retail? Well, business has changed tremendously in the last uh, 50 or 60 years. Retail has changed, life has changed, but the basic principles are still the same. Work hard, uh, do a day's, uh, a day's uh, uh, work for a day's pay or more work than pay. And the principles are still the same. There are great opportunities. And uh, somebody who starts business the right way today, I think can make even a bigger success than what was able to do 50 years ago. Because funds, money is available for good things. In those days, there was no money available. Credit's easier today. Is that what <laughs> a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, no comparison between what happened in the 50s and what can happen in, in, in 2009 and 10. What is the future of, of retail? I mean, is, is the shopping centre model going to be here for a while? I think so. I think, I think uh, retail has changed a lot and the shopping centre can facilitate the changes in retail as they come along. As a matter of fact, it leads many of the changes in retail that, uh, that is taking place. What about the internet? Well, the internet is another, another outlet. I mean, there are plenty of outlets. There were plenty and many of them closed down and some of them opening. It's another retail opportunity. Is it a threat though? Well, it's a threat or maybe it's an opportunity. You've charted a, a very successful course through the ups and downs in the economy um, yeah. over the, the last 50 or 60 years. We keep being told the current economic downturn is the gravest crisis since the Great Depression. Do you think that is overstating it though? Well, I think uh, maybe a year ago or maybe a bit less, I'm not sure, it appeared that, it's, uh, that, that there was grave danger of falling into some kind of abyss. But I think that danger has more or less, well, disappeared maybe is the wrong word, but uh, it has subsided. And I think we are heading to uh, maybe a sustained for a number of years of low growth and whatever else comes with it. But I'm pleased to say that Australia is well positioned. So does that mean we've hit the bottom in your view or we still got a little bit further to go mm, down? It's hard to say but I think we are very either hit the bottom or very close to it. And low growth for some years to come you think for Probably. Australia? Probably. I mean you know unemployment, consumer confidence, uh, all these things are, are very important but um, as I say Australia is very well placed in that environment. Of course, uh, Westfield hasn't been immune from the downturn. You had to, uh, last year, write down some more than $3 billion worth of assets last calendar year. So you haven't been unaffected. But retail sales have held up pretty well in Australia, haven't they, compared Very to the well. rest of the retail world? Retail sales have held up. But just on the write down, I think we have to take into account that in the last maybe five or ten years, we have wrote a lot, a lot up. So we've given a little bit back, you know. And, and, and you have to take that into context. Nothing can grow forever. Trees don't grow to the sky, you know. And, 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 and so you have these downturns. It's a natural thing to happen. They, uh, when, when do they happen? If you can pick the timing, then I think you're <laughs> doing the well. Key. 
But the write down was uh, relatively small compared to what we have achieved in the last number of years. As far as uh, retail is concerned Austra in Australia, we are doing very well currently. The, most of the world, you know, I'm traveling around a lot. And people can't understand how come Australia is doing so well, particularly in, in retail and, 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 and associated services. Well, we are doing well because we are in a good country, the good base. The policies uh, of the government seems to uh, hit the spot m on most places. And uh, generally, we don't have as much debt as many of other countries have. Would you give credit to the government for those stimulus packages, for the well, healthy that, figures on retail that we've seen here? Oh, yes, most of those things were very good for the country and for, for consumers. We and do, however. The, low, the, the lower strata of uh, income, uh, you know, that was very good for them, yeah. We do, however, carry uh, more debt now, and we're going to be carrying a, a record level of debt as a result of these spending measures. You're a former member of the Reserve Bank yeah. Board. Uh, is too much debt, is this level of debt the government's going to get us into a cause for concern? Well, I think, uh, I think what we need to think of is will the government continue with debt or continue with less, uh, less of this stimulus and uh, how the next few years is going to pan out. Obviously, we can't overburden ourselves with debt that we cannot repay. If you borrow money, you've got to pay it back, you know. So I think we need to be careful on that, we have to be measured on that. And I think uh, the economist and the Reserve Bank and uh, the, the Treasury and the government, I think will take that all that into consideration. But it's, it's $315 billion worth of debt, which is uh, the amount they're going to get us into. If you yeah. were running the show, would that be too much debt? Would you be worried about that level of debt? Well, I'm sure I would be worried about any debt. I worry about them all the time. But the level of debt is really very important to see. And, um, and balance it out. But I think that we have good responsibility, good economists, good institutions, and good government to take care of those things. At the moment, there's nothing else, you can, nothing else the government can do but get into the debt. But of course, you have to see the level of debt in relative terms to other countries. So it's not, uh, you're not playing this game alone. You, know? you, you, you are relative to others. And relatively, Australia is doing very well. You said when you were 60 that you would uh, retire at 65. You're now 78. You're going very strong. You're involved not only in running Westfield, but the, the World Cup bid as well. Yeah. Any thoughts of ever slowing down, Frank Lowy? Well, look, I will work as long as I can and as long as I'm able to. And uh, when I don't, well, I won't. And uh, the retirement is really not in my hands. It's in God's hand. And not on your mind, though? Well, not on my mind. It would be silly for me not to think about it. But uh, so far, so good. I feel good. I work hard and I enjoy it most of the time. Sometimes I don't, obviously. But I, I keep working uh, in whatever I do and uh, hope to produce more and more during my lifetime. How difficult is the question of succession in a, in a family business empire like yours? Well, I'm very lucky in that regard. I think I would be more, I, could, I consider myself the luckiest father alive because um, I've got uh, this, we have got these three sons who are very talented and doing a very good job in wherever they are. And uh, I'm quite confident that when the time comes, they, together with other executives, will be able to step up and run Westfield successfully further, maybe even more successfully than when I am here. Frank Lowy, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.